Right, good evening everyone. I know we're not in our normal place and it's taken some people quite a while to find us. Nevertheless, I think we will start. Uh, my name's Craig Jeffrey. I'm the director of the Australia India Institute and it gives me huge pleasure this evening to welcome a friend, a brilliant scholar, Dr. Emma Maudsley from the University of Cambridge to give tonight's keywords lecture on development. I'd like to start uh, by the, giving the acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the land upon which the University at Parkville is, pace, is based. I'd like to uh, acknowledge their elders, past and present, and pay particular respects to any Aboriginal people who are here in the audience this evening. Dr. Maudsley uh, taught me development uh, about 23, 24 years ago at the University of Cambridge where she was working as a graduate student and she was my supervisor. <coughs> and one thing that Emma uh, was at pains to stress at that point, and it remains as relevant today, was that there are different ideological approaches to development. And we learned in particular the importance of dependency theory, of left-wing Marxist approaches to development, and on the other hand, we learnt about neoliberalist uh, approaches to development promulgated particularly at the time by the World Bank and the IMF that emphasised free market approaches to social and economic development. And what's very interesting, I think, looking back on uh, that supervision in Cambridge 23, 24 years later, is what both of those approaches to development that I learnt about then shared. Both approaches imagined development as something that emanated from the global north, from uh, Europe, North America, uh, and was then implemented in so-called developing countries, including South Asia, Asia more broadly, Africa and Latin America. And the genius, I think, of the presentation that Emma's going to give this evening, uh, and I think it reflects a, a wider shift in scholarly thinking, is to focus on countries in the global south as themselves development donors to other countries in the global south. So rather than imagining development as something that emanates from the west, we're thinking much more of multi-centered processes of uh, development, of uh, the promulgation of development. Now, of course, one lens to which to think about that issue would be China. Emma is going to focus, I think, rather on India in line with the, uh, with the, the, the series, the keyword series. And as many of you will know, what's quite interesting about uh, India's experience of development over the last 15 to 20 years is it's worked very hard to reposition itself, not as a recipient of donor aid, but actually as a provider of aid as a driver of development through money and other kinds of assistance it's provided to neighboring South Asian countries, uh, to countries in Africa and elsewhere. Emma's going to give us chapter and verse. I think this is a superbly interesting topic that relates to a lot of the interests of people that I can see around the room here. And there's a lot of familiar faces this evening uh, in terms of economic, political, global change. Dr. Emma Morsley's supremely uh, well placed to give us an introduction to this very interesting issue and I, I say introduction because we'll ha also have a chance in the second half of the hour and a half that we have this evening to enter into a discussion and for you to ask questions. Emma is a reader at the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. She formerly taught in Durham and, and Birkbeck and, and before that in Cambridge itself. Emma began her career working, her, her scholarly career, working on questions around environmental politics and regional politics in India. She did her, her dissertation, a PhD dissertation, a series of, of uh, really important articles on the non secessionist regionalist movement that occurred in Uttarakhand in um, the, uh, particularly the early 1990s. Uh, 
Uh, she's since been involved in uh, writing more broadly on environmental change in India, a superb piece in development and change on middle class environmental politics in India that's very widely cited and seminal in its importance. More recently still, Emma's uh, really turned to look at uh, questions of South-South cooperation, uh, South-South lending in the development field, uh, with a particular focus in India, but also working more broadly. And most recently, Emma's also been interested in how countries in the global north are repositioning development in the context of an increased focus on uh, private uh, market solutions to development and in the context of an increasing need or perceived need uh, among national governments in the global north to justify aid in the context of other national priorities. So it's, it's a huge pleasure to welcome someone who has been an academic mentor for me for a very long time, who has uh, been really important in inspiring generations of people, particularly in the UK, to become interested in development in India. Uh, it, it's not Emma's first time in Australia by any means, but uh, I think her first time in Melbourne for quite a, quite a while. She's already interacted with many people at the Australia India Institute. It's a real genuine pleasure to, to be able to host you, Emma. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation this evening. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the very uh, kind introduction and thank you very much for inviting me and being here this evening. Uh, it probably won't surprise you if I tell you that um, supervising Craig was really quite intimidating uh, as a fresh first year undergraduate faced with this extraordinarily bright guy who was also his supervision partner, Harriet, who's now a professor of geography at Durham, was equally bright and the two of them were ferociously competitive. Uh, so I, I used to turn up with my notebook and uh, learn from them. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about Indian development cooperation, but I'm going to start with a prequel. Um, I'm going to try and get through fairly quickly because I've been told you're all really fantastic questioners and, the, and that sounds more interesting. So um, I'll do what I can. So the prequel is about um, development. So some of you, or many of you, will be familiar with Gillian Hart's um, schematic of the dominant international political economy regimes and of dominant development ideologies and their countercurrents within the mainstream. And she would be the first to say that this is a schematic, and in, in being so, it, it sort of overlooks some complexities. But this is the sort of development that I learnt as a um, undergraduate geographer taught by Stuart Corbridge, who I know has been here, and which for the first sort of 15 years or so of teaching development geography, I taught about. This is what I taught about. Um, and uh, sort of a classic, sort of lots of different, of changing ideologies, changing theories. Craig mentioned um, dependency theory. We have Wallerstein writing about world systems. In the 1990s, you get this amazing flourishing of critical response, uh, radical post-structuralist response, like Arturo Escobar. 2006, we get you know, very much within the mainstream, Jeffrey Sachs writing about the need for more aid. But in their own way, what they all share, despite powerful differences, is a focus on the North-South, and very limited, if not entirely excluding a whole load of other historical contexts and debates and drivers and actors in the field of international development. These are treated really in, by the mainstream as sort of invisible or simply as a sort of marginal side game. But they're much more important than this that I'm going to ask, so, uh, uh, to suggest. So we see here um, some of the uh, third world leaders at the Bandung conference, you'll spot Nehru in the middle. Um, UNCTAD, which was the uh, site of a lot of kind of advancements. It was marginalized within the UN, but really tried to drive the interests of southern states. Robert Mugabe, a young Robert Mugabe meeting Chairman Mao, um, a Chinese propaganda poster of the solidarity of the, uh, of the colonized and exploited nations. And this is actually the 2009 meeting of the non-aligned summit at, in Egypt. So if we look at, re-look at Hart's development schematic, we might say, well, you know, all of this was happening too. And I was taught about this, I came across it all the time, but somehow it drifted out of consciousness when I was teaching and thinking about international development. And in, related to all of these, what was going on throughout this time? 
was something that is now called South-South Cooperation. There's lots of problems with these terms. Do we include the Gulf in the South? Uh, there's a big difference between South-South Cooperation when you're talking about, say, Senegal and Morocco and China. So it's a, it's a very umbrella term which has its deficiencies, but we we'll, can call it South-South Cooperation. So if we come to India um, and some of the sorts of development, classic development debates taking place, here's uh, Nehru talking in front of the Bakra Dam, famously, you know, Nehru's Temple of Modernity, um, a Punjabi uh, beneficiary of the Green Revolution. The newspaper article is from 1966 and it's part of that very uh, contested and hostile relationship between um, uh, later in Dira Gandhi and others, but between India and the IMF and the World Bank. Nehru being kind of um, coshed by PL 480. And then, you know, later the sort of um, radical critiques of Indian development are still really framed around the, the, some of those sort of big ideas of North-South. And in fact, all of these were inflected by other things, by the Soviet Union, by India's other relationships. But in the way in the textbooks I was reading and the stuff I was doing, we imagine those as complex debates, hybrid debates around modernity and so on. We know Nehru's relationship with a sort of um, a, a, a notion of modernity that wasn't entirely by any means Western and a rejection of that idea. But nonetheless, it sort of seemed to be framed in that classic North-South way. So, I was starting to gather thing, you know, little, it was more, I have to say it was more serendipity than, um, than anything else, but I started to feel uncomfortable and around 2005 was picking up on some of this emerging work around China and Africa that seemed very interesting to me. And I was reminded of Anne McClintock, who way back sort of said post-colonialism is haunted by the very figure it seeks to displace as it continues to privilege Europe as the central subject of history by reorienting the world around the single axis of the colonial and post-colonial. And it seemed to me that um, as someone who was broadly uh, a critical scholar of international development, in a curious way, I was repeating what McClintock was talking about in that being a critic of uh, international development, or at least critically engaging with some of its assumptions and ideologies and vehicles and so on, I was also reinscribing that power. I too was um, overlooking a, a different axis of international development. And this, um, I suppose there was a, a kind of a moment when I read Ilan Kapoor's fantastic book on the post-colonial politics of development, really superb book, and he has a chapter on aid as gift, and he uses gift theory uh, to explore the work that aid does to create unequal hierarchies. And he says, you know, actually, um, there are other countries that give aid too, Egypt, China, India, Brazil, and then they just disappear from view, and he gets back to north-south, and he critiques northern aid as um, as, as basically constructed to create these hierarchies and inferiorities of the recipients. And I thought, well, hang on, hang on. What about these other countries he's just mentioned? Are they exempt from these post-colonial critiques of the work that aid does to produce power differences and, and to create the identity of the giver and the recipient? This is stuff that Uma Qatari, who I know has been a visitor to Melbourne, has done brilliantly and looked at the way in which the development industry is a sort of a regime of knowledge and as a, as a producer of certain identities is um, intimately bound up with the construction of inferiority and superiority in global politics. So now in 2017, it is impossible to imagine any debate taking place within development or any uh, policy forum taking place without the presence of particularly, say, the BRICS. So we've got, you know, the BRICS leaders meeting up there a little while ago when uh, Manmohan Singh was still prime minister, you know, Chinese uh, development projects. And this is um, the, uh, one of the first meetings of the Global Partnership Steering Committee, which is an attempt by the, by basically by the DAC to reinvent itself as a more inclusive, open body. And it has three co-chairs, Justine Greening, the, the, Brit, the Brits really 
sharp elbows, muscled everyone else aside and said, we're going to represent the donor countries. It stepped on a few toes on the way. Um, so there's a, uh, it, I think it's um, Sierra Leone, Indonesia and the UK represented as co-chairs. Because it is absolute, this is revolutionary. It used to be the do donors who would get together in a room and decide on development policy. The idea that you would have a recipient country, a recipient donor and a donor country creating, you know, providing the leadership of aid policy, of development, was unimaginable 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. And now it's impossible not to do it this way. So a lot has changed. Okay, so that's the prequel, which is development has been uh, historically in both its mainstream and its critical forms, uh, overwhelmingly focused on the north-south axis. And then you've got this really extraordinary set of changes happening over the last 10 to 15 years, but with a long historical um, genealogy about South-South. And I'm finally going to talk about India. So I'm going to start with sort of what Indian Development Corporation actually is, just to give a really short, quick flavor. And then I just thought I'd try out four themes, just pick out four interesting things from it. So we'll come to those. First of all, what is it? Um, it's not aid. It's not co coterminous, it's not analogous to foreign aid. There's lots of parts of development cooperation that act in very similar ways, that are similar modalities. There's lots that would be defined as aid. Um, there are also shared and similar, say, motivations as aid but it's not exactly aid. Um, and in fact, the idea that development cooperation is aid is actively resisted by Indians and others. And they insist that it, they are not donors providing aid because the his history of being a recipient of aid in India is not a good one. It's being on the wrong end of sort of co Cold War geopolitics of aid being used as a tool to force um, change of uh, the hierarchical identities of donor and recipient. So, it, it, Indian Development Corporation, like China, like Brazil, covers things that would typically look very like aid. Some grants, soft loans, some debt relief, um, scholarships and technical assistance. But it also is used to talk about trade and investment and diplomatic solidarity, certainly humanitarian assistance and peacekeeping. And these, are, these go back decades for India. So this, uh, India's been doing a lot of this for a long time. Um, and then more recently, there's lots of initiatives. So lines of credit are a form of soft loan. And they actually started in 1966, extraordinarily, when India's economy was really crunched. And I'll come back to why that was happening. But they've got, had a new life. They've expanded enormously in the last decade. There are new institutions like the India-Africa Forum Summit um, which meets now between India and almost every single African head of state and entourages and business communities and so on. Um, lots of roles for India's private sector and private sector representatives. And I'll come to this forum for Indian Development Corporation, possibly a voice for civil society in Indian Development Corporation. Okay. Um, it's very hard to say what does India actually give because it depends how you define it. The main point about this is, first of all, if you look at, say, loans and grants, they're going up. And the second is that purchasing power parity makes a huge difference. So that if you are providing an um, engineer to a Ugandan bridge project, you, an Indian engineer might cost $19,000 yeah, $19, for a year's work. A Swiss engineer might cost $90,000. You get a lot of bang for your buck, basically, if you're, if, if, or sacks of grain or um, scholarships. So although India is actually quite a substantial provider of loans and grants, by some calculations, about 1.6 billion a year, which puts it higher than 11 DAC donors. Once you put in PPP, it really is quite, um, quite impressive. Just to take a quick look, Grants aren't actually a very large part of its portfolio. Sorry, I don't know if you can see this, but the one on the left is the grants, and the, they mainly go to the region. So the biggest recipient of grants is Bhutan. Uh, Afghanistan's up there, Nepal and others. 
So the grants are going within the region, and they're obviously part of India's kind of developmental compact with these small states on its uh, boundaries. The lines of credit are overwhelmingly going to African partners, and they're expanding. And these are a much more commercial tool. So they're badged as development cooperation, but they're, they're very much about the expansion of economic uh, opportunities. So um, if, for example, uh, a five million pound line of cooperation is offered to Kenya, they say the Kenyans can tell what they want. You know, they might say, okay, we want to um, make a uh, factory for buses. But they have to use 75% of the loan to buy Indian goods and services. And Western commentators sometimes critique India for that. But India says, well, we're poor as well. You know, so everyone's getting a good deal. We're getting our goods and services bought. We're opening up these economic partnerships. Kenya's getting cheap buses, cheap loans. It's win-win. Another important part of India's development partnerships is the Indian Technical and Economic Corporation Programme, created in 1964. This is really not about India as a rich country now giving to other countries. It's always been about poor countries coming together in various forms of solidarity, non-alignment, third world spirit, um, Bandung and so on. So this goes back to 1964 and it's about projects and training and experts and so on. And over the years it's provided thousands and thousands of places um, and the scheme is really growing very rapidly. These placements are growing and again our African partners take up a very large number. So just a small photo of a typical one quite recently run by the Ministry of Finance. It's a four to six week course uh, on accounts and finance, but you can see the sort of cosmopolitan crowd. Um, and Delhi is, is, I mean, I'm sure, you know, as you know, it, it's fantastic sort of, uh, say, hanging out in uh, the Habitat Center and talking to students from all over Africa or Southeast Asia who've come to come and do courses on solar power or something else. So India sponsors these sorts of training programs uh, and has done for a very long time. It also has launched in the last few years a number of flagship programs some of which fall some way short of the, of the promise at the moment anyway. So for example, it announced 19 training institutions, um, lots of uh, things like a virtual university, uh, the Pan-Africa EE network. So it's got these flagship programs which really badge the idea of India as a provider, particularly around ICTs and the digital economy and this sort of thing. Diplomacy is another big leg of development cooperation. Um, and I mentioned the India-Africa Forum Summit is a particularly important part of that. Um, so this is, uh, as well as the, the regional relationships, it's also bilateral. So um, in the first meetings, in recent meetings in Nepal and Bhutan, very significant packages of development assistance are um, promised. And uh, Narendra Modi's inaugural speech at the UN, he pointed out, he, was, he foregrounded India's role as a development provider of ideas, of resources, and so on. Just a couple of days ago, uh, the UN announced a partnership with India uh, to promote sustainable development in small island states. In the press release, I want to point to something and come back to it later. The press release said, India's approach to our partnership, sorry, this is Modi, uh, 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 Baruddin saying this, India's approach to our partnership across the globe is one that can be encapsulated with the term Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which means the whole world is one family. This sounds classic kind of um, BJP appeal to a sort of Sanskritic term. And I'll, I'll come back to why this is interesting later on. Uh, so the South-South, um, oh, not corporation, should be cooperation for us is long held tradition. Well, cooperation is kind of a revealing slippage. <laughs> that's not my typo, that's his. Um, but for the first time, we're working with the United Nations on a project which is diplomatic of our times. In other words, you know, you don't turn around to the United States or to Australia to lead the sustainable you know, development initiative. You turn around to somewhere like India. Finally, get out the big guns. In terms of soft power, who better than Shah Rukh Khan? Um, so in all sorts of ways, development cooperation is, is being um, enrolled in and being part of India's soft power initiative around the world. So development cooperation is now um, part of a sort of a public diplomacy magazine. 
And this public diplomacy magazine that goes, uh, it's translated into, I think, about 20 different languages. It goes around to diplomatic offices all around the world. And it's basically Tendulkar, it's Bollywood, it's cricket, it's food, and it's development cooperation, what China's doing in the Gambia and stuff like that. So, so India's development cooperation profile is, both, is, is really being sold much better than it has been in the past. Okay, so I mentioned then, if that's a very, very lightning tour through some of the different elements of development cooperation, four um, kind of ways of thinking about it. So the first is from Bandung to a muscular pragmatism. Something that I've um, been writing and arguing about uh, for a number of non-Western donors is a shift in narrative. So in India, the first sort of 60 years of Indian development cooperation was very, very strongly narrativized around that sort of Nehruvian language of solidarity, of third worldism, uh, of um, a kind of a moral internationalism. So for example, um, I mentioned these um, scholarships and although they were very modest in their sort of materiality, if you like, they were symbolically making big claims you know, we too share your experience of being a colonized country. We too share your aspirations to break free from an unjust post-colonial world order. We are not just the recipients of Western knowledge, but also we are providers. So, and this is what Rosie Ogilvy says, you know, we have to um, be aware that uh, Indian development cooperation is not just, has not just accompanied its massive economic flowering in the last decade and two decades. It's not a narrative in which its economic rise has allowed it to break the ceiling into an existing donor club, but instead we have to recognize that India's aid activities are part of an alternative trajectory to that of traditional donors. So, a little while ago I came up with this um, device, um, and I've got two asterisks on it, which both of which I'm going to come back to. And I always used to joke when I put this up that post-structuralists in the audience look away now. Mm -hmm. This is a, a grotesque violation of uh, post-structuralist thinking and um, putting things into horribly simplifying boundary, uh, binaries um, does terrible violence to, um, to reality. And you know, I used to joke about this and then carry on and use it as I'm doing tonight. And I'll come back to why I regret that um, later on. Anyway, I suggested that very broadly, very broadly, if you wanted to understand the sort of narrative framing, the discursive uh, way in which um, aid on the one hand for Western donors and development cooperation for Southern partners was framed, you could see, say that the public understanding of aid was primarily as a charitable flow. So whether you thought it was noble or naive, most Australians imagine that aid is a sort of charitable flow from Australia to PNG or wherever. That it's a moral obligation perhaps to the unfortunate, it's based on the superiority of our knowledge and things like that. Uh, that it's, it rests on sympathy for the distant other, um, that, you know, the sort of classic NGO poster of a, of a woman holding a crying baby or whatever and that the morality comes through a Judeo-Christian idea of the uh, suspension of the obligation to return. So if we're out in the pub, Craig buys me a beer. Um, Craig? Craig buys me a beer, where are you? Uh, okay, just, just dropping that idea. Um, and you know, Craig, Craig would at some point expect me to buy him a beer back, and that establishes our equality. Um, if I'm out with one of my students, I might keep buying the beers, and that, in a sense, is reflective of our hierarchy, but one day I expect them to get better off than me and buy me the beers, and they can return the obligation. So there's a sort of this idea of there's a, there's a virtue, but as, um, as, as uh, uh, many people have said, the problem with the idea of the gift is that it's humiliating for the recipient. Southern Development Partnership is based on a really different set of narratives of, of working with, say, in Bangladesh or in Kenya, not as a sort of, not as a charity, but as an opportunity, reflecting solidarity, 
reflecting direct expertise of what it's like to struggle with, for example, uh, monsoonal roads or uh, agricultural systems and so on. It's not about sympathy, but it's about empathy. Uh, and there is a virtue to the idea of mutual re reciprocity. So it's not an inferior form of aid because it's set in a win-win narrative. Quite the opposite, that it retains the dignity of the partner by couching it as a mutual beneficial relationship. Um, so if, 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 to put this, say, to see this in action, um, I've got a quote from Shashi Tharoor and a visit to Mauritius. And this is a, a classic example of the sort of emollient language of Indian development cooperation a few years ago, and to some extent today. So the India-Africa partnership, partnership has deep roots in history. Linked across the Indian Ocean, we have been neighbors and partners for thousands of years. The advent of the Europeans in the colonial period disturbed these interactions, but could not disrupt them. Later, both India and Africa shared the pain of subjugation and the joys of freedom and liberation. Satyagraha, nonviolence, and active opposition to injustice and discrimination were first used by Mahatma Gandhi on the continent of Africa. Nehru was also a firm believer and practitioner of the principle of, of Afro-Asian solidarity. So this is, this is a kind of, you know, that sort of language put into the specific context of um, Shashi Tharoor building uh, economic ties and other forms of relationship with Mauritius. Priya Chako um, has done some fantastic work on this, on Indian foreign policy, of which this is one part. And what I really like about her work very much is that she sort of argues that it can't be confined by essentially Western concepts of realism versus idealism. And if you actually look at Nehru's foreign policy um, uh, influences and his, his language and, and, and what he talked about, he's drawing on Gandhi and Marx and Russell and Buddha and Tagore to try to chart a form of kind of uh, moral internationalist nationalism. And, and she talks about some of the tensions and conflicts within this project. And Indian Development Corporation for 60 years sort of inhabited this language. It was often very pragmatic in practice, but the, the sort of narrative was about India's place in the world. I think it's changing. I think we're starting as, uh, after a decade of expansion and very sub substantial sort of footprint in the ground in other countries, I think under Modi, but even a little bit before that, we're seeing a much more muscular framing. Um, so for example, in a recent ORF publication, Aneja and Nagambon said, uh, the ethical mooring of India's development partnership need not lie in lofty moral principles. Of course, the sort of uh, Nehruvian association is uh, not necessarily what the BJP particularly want. And at the same time, they're sort of arguing that was an old era of India as uh, a, a, a kind of third worldist country. And this is not the image that they want to move forward. Uh, it's interesting, they're still talking about finding a moral principle, but instead we should be derived from sustaining legitimate and accountable processes. In other words, a sustainable ethical mooring could be derived from a pragmatic lens of delivering programs that have value for money and delivered through effective, transparent and accountable delivery mechanisms. This looks really just like the Germans talking about aid or the British, you know, aid is a technical project. It's stripped away of that kind of, of that um, ideological commitment to solidarity between poorer countries. And I think this is, says something about the sort of changing geopolitics. Um, I'll come to that in a second. So Africa is now back as a growth opportunity for India. And this is happening in, in other countries too. Um, I've charted it out with uh, PhD students of mine from Brazil. And this is a nice quote from um, the, an Indonesian um, politician, the South-South cooperation, in this case technical cooperation, are being framed in terms of the direct benefits they can bring to Indonesia. An Indonesia first policy, this was pre-Trump, um, designed to complement domestic development policies and the projects were increasingly scrutinized on a what's in it for us basis. So I think we're seeing a change in South-South cooperation, in the, in the language of South-South cooperation, uh, including in Indian development cooperation towards a stronger uh, if you like, realist framing or, and, and, and uh, less of the third worldist solidarity, more of the what are we going to get out of this? 
Um, so, for example, and this is caught up with a, very strongly the identity of we are no longer recipients. Um, so we can see that uh, India now claims it gives more than it receives. Um, it chucked its own, uh, many of its own donors out in 2003, and it's, and it's very much caught up with this kind of a more assertive, more muscular presence on the world stage. I'm not going to say who, but somebody not unknown to you all, a rather loquacious and energetic senior member of a think tank in Delhi told me that um, we're not part of a loser's club. You know, can you imagine Nehru saying we're not part of a loser's club? You know, and, he, and what he was doing was sort of saying, we're not part of the BRICS. We're not part of the, the, you know, we don't want to be part of the South and this kind of, you know, this sort of identity. We're going to be uh, the new world power. That's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, so the first is then this bandung to this more muscular thing. So the second thing that I thought I'd sort of try and think about in this uh, development cooperation is to think about boundary work. So all donors perform and create and work boundaries when they um, enter into development partnerships. And there are two sorts of boundaries that I think are interesting here. One is with the West. So the, the, what, some of the work I do now is about the way in which Western aid, I include Australia and New Zealand, those uncomfortable geographical terms, um, has been really disconcerted, really shaken. Um, and India has been a powerful voice. Uh, fine, it's always pointed out the illegitimacy of these development hierarchies, but now it can do so with some force behind it. And in fact, it's been a, a, a it's helped, kept its distance from the blandishments. Now the West is desperate to get these new donors in through the door, China in particular. China's actually been fairly cooperative. And India's saying, mm, we're not sure, we're not interested. So it's tended to be very selective. It's tended to focus on southern institutions. To come back then to this discursive framing. So the first problem with this is, I said it's a discursive framing, it's a d public understanding, it's, it's how a kind of a sort of a dominant narrative of Western donors. Uh, this kind of graph unfortunately took life and travelled a lot around India and elsewhere. And um, I've repeatedly ever since, to my eternal regret, told, have been told by people that um, Western donors uh, act out of charity and they um, are motivated by moral obligation to the unfortunate. And it's just like, no, 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 that's the public discourse. There's a real politique going on. There's lots of other stuff happening. And um, there's been a confusion, I think, in, in, amongst some commentators about how to frame Western aid. Western aid, I mean, it's immensely complicated, has lots and lots of um, different dimensions and different parts. And, and this framing is only one particular heuristic reading. Anyway, so this has really come back to bite me um, because um, it's quoted back at me as, um, and the Indians aren't like this. And it's like, well, the West isn't really like that either. That's just the sort of narrative. So um, it's one of the, yeah, an artifact that took on a life of its own and the danger of PowerPoint, right? Um, <laughs> And because I didn't do surround it with my joke about post-structuralism. <laughs> okay, so so there's been there's a lot of kind of we're not like the West. It, to, to some extent, true, and in other ways, not true. But it's a very useful device to go, we're not like you colonial powers seeking to, you know, m you know, put right your misadventures and all that sort of thing, or we're not like you colonial powers desperately trying to hold on to power through aid. Uh, so there's, and, and sometimes I think quite legitimate, and other times relying on something of a caricature of Western aid. The really interesting boundary work is with China. So in a lot of speeches and texts and conversations, um, Indian development cooperation is compared to that of China. And the, basically it's that China are steely, vicious exploiters who are only interested in economic growth and taking everything they can from their partners and are ruthless in their capture of resources. Uh, whereas we Indians are people from the heart. You know, we, we, we want inclusive development. We want to grow together. 
And the irony is, of course, that the Chinese say exactly the same thing, that we want inclusive development, we are people of the heart, this is about friendship and solidarity. Um, so that while there are significant differences between Chinese and Indian development cooperation in terms of scale and some term, in terms of sector, there's no doubt that um, some of this boundary making is, is, is not so much reliant on um, reality so much as a certain projection of identity and difference. So um, Jairam Ramesh, I just saw brilliantly said, the first principle of India's involvement in Africa is unlike that of China. China says, go out and exploit the natural resources, and our strategy is to add value. I mean, all, you could, I'm, not, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but you could take France, Germany, China, or India, and you'd be much, I think, you know, they might all say the same thing, and you might all hold them all up to account for that sort of statement. You know, the Indian way is totally different. Um, China's indifferent to the political situation. India hasn't been insensitive. Ours is private sector, and China is um, public sector, which is not entirely true. Again, India has a lot of public sector engagement. Um, I'll just jump this, but it's the same thing. This was a, um, this was a comment following an article by Sachin Chattavedi. There were 11 web comments. Um, so it's anonymous, it's, uh, you know, it's not a scientific survey. But I thought what was interesting about it was it, it both critiques, but you can also see the curious attraction so China is often uh, cr criticized in much the same way that the West criticizes China and Africa, but also at the same time, it's like, God, China's so bad, and why aren't we more like China? You know, there's the sort of sense that China, for all its kind of um, uh, evil genius, is more effective than India. So I love the, the last bit is, India needs to invest more wisely and be less handicapped with morality and good intentions in its aid program. Um, so, you know, the Chinese bribe local politicians, dictators, general warlords, and they get their companies to swamp nations in Africa. And India's softly, softly approach hasn't yielded this sort of political capital. So you can see a kind of contradiction, a tension in that sort of China's being really bad, but oh, it's really good at being really bad. And if we were really bad, we'd be getting all these benefits. So the third um, theme is this idea of what's the relationship then with domestic development. So one of the core principles of South-South cooperation is that China, Brazil, India, other countries, Thailand, Chile, Mexico, can draw upon their own developmental successes. In tropical contexts, in third world contexts, in the context of expanding economies or transitioning economies, however you want to put it. And India can do this really well. I, I was talking to a really, really nice guy from Dakbavan, from the Indian post office, and he was running a project in three East African countries to try and improve their postal services. And he was, he was great because he, he was telling me about the fact that because India has such incredible expertise and experience at delivering the post in very distant places or maybe to places where you have high degrees of illiteracy or where you don't exactly have, you know, number one, number two, number three, number four. It really knows how to do this and it's very good at it. Um, and he was, and, and in a way that's the, the, the perfect, the emblematic development cooperation program. Two countries that, exp or four countries that experience similar challenges helping each other out, in this case India helping these countries. And this is this um, quote, it's a long quote, sorry, by Manish Chand, really captures this sense that, you know, India's ICTs and digital um, abilities and super speciality hospitals, it's, you know, all available to um, help to, to provide assistance to uh, re other countries in the region and so on. The, sh the short, I'm going to be quick about this, but basically, I think there's great truth to a lot of this. There's some really, really fabulous programs. But in all official communication and in, um, in, in, and in a lot of the sort of think tank stuff around it, there is precisely zero discussion of the contradictions of development and the violence of India's own development models. Um, so the, the internal, the domestic debate within India about um, dispossession, about poverty, about the relationship between resource extraction or distribution or welfare. This does not go into India's development cooperation debates. 
So for example, uh, brilliantly, um, grain brought together, uh, land activists in India and Ethiopia got together to say, we are, we are both being dispossessed. People are being dispossessed by the same companies, by the same great big companies who are buying up land uh, and moving people off in Ethiopia and in India. And, and they tried to come together to protest and not a single government minister in Delhi would see them. And they wouldn't have even been able to have the meeting in Ethiopia. The, the police would have not uh, enabled that meeting. So um, there is uh, a colleague and I, uh, Supriya Roy Chowdhury, uh, and I uh, wrote a chapter on civil society organizations and development cooperation. And we were invited to uh, a meeting in the Taj Palace sponsored by the Asia Foundation. And we were the, I was like one of three non-Indians present, which was a great honor to be invited to this because one of the interesting things about development cooperation in the academia is the way in which uh, Westerners are being pushed out of these um, conversations. And I think that's fantastic. It's about time, you know, it's a really interesting kind of upsetting of some of the uh, uh, hierarchies of development knowledge and so on. So I was very honored to be invited. Um, but Supriya and I had written this chapter and we made the case that, um, that Indian development cooperation needed to engage more with the conversation between the domestic and the external. So uh, doing development in Nepal uh, or Bangladesh, how, how, did they, how should that be uh, kind of brought into conversation with some of the complications and tensions and, uh, in India? And everyone in the room just absolutely hammered us. They, they, they were furious and we got really, really, really uh, criticized. And every single person in the, in the workshop came up to me later and said, you know, you've got a really good point, but can't really say it. You know, so there's, um, it, 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 there's a tremendous reluctance to politicize development, to put development in that more complex space. Um, and there are plenty of counter narratives um, which are not acknowledged so far in the sort of mainstream uh, discussion. So this is a, a student of mine uh, who did her dissertation in Tanzania. She's actually working with BRAC. These are Bangladeshis working in Tanzania. And one of the problems that they have is the first thing they have to do is try and assure people they're not Indians. Um, because in, in Tanzania, to be Indian is, is not necessarily to be a good thing um, because of a, 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 some of those historical tensions. So when we go back to Shashi Tharoor's kind of very confident Indian-African partnership, it does what all of these things are meant to do, right? He's a diplomat. He's not going to go into detail about more complicated areas. But there are these more complicated areas. And at the moment, they're not, part, they're not being particularly excavated or investigated or confronted within the Indian Development Cooperation community. So um, it seems to me that, again, like other Southern partners, because of, I think, part of a very um, proud, strong genealogy, genealogy in, the, in, the, in non-alignment and in the drive for justice between states within an unfair world system, South-South cooperation is still really about states fighting for a more fair um, distribution of global power and resources. And the problem with that is I think it takes away from the idea of the more um, compromises about development within states so that justice between states is still part of the narrative and less justice within states. So it's very much around modernization and win-win development and uh, has rather limited engagement with some of the costs and the consequences of modernization, of dams, of roads, of agribusiness and so on. Um, that might, there might there's, there's, things are happening, things are changing, maybe with the slightly stronger role of um, think tanks and media and academics and CSOs, that might change. Okay, last, last one, um, and uh, sort of hinted at this before. Something that's really fascinating to me is the fact that um, 10, 15 years ago, as China, India, Brazil started to really move with some flourish into more visibly into the field of development cooperation, a number of people in the West sort of thought, oh, well, you know, we'll have to show them how to become proper donors. 15 years later, the UK looks more like India than India looks like the UK. There has been a southernization of uh, development cooperation. Um, uh, 
so that some of those kind of core features of southern development cooperation, a focus on economic growth rather than poverty reduction, a focus on infrastructure rather than governance. Um, they, they, the, the, the Western donors have moved to more towards the South than the other direction. Barack Obama, you know, turns up in 2015. In, in, in 2000, you've still got the sort of West turning around to Africa saying you really have to do it our way. In 2015, with China breathing down the US's neck and everyone else, uh, with India looking like a really attractive partner, um, the US, the, the Brits, the French have to be a bit more careful. And we've really seen a change in some of the, the narratives of uh, Western aid. Um, our very own Justine Greening, formerly um, Secretary of State for International Development, for example, actually launched a major development initiative through a partnership with the London Stock Exchange, that well-known Oxfam of the city, um, because development is being um, explicitly reworked as a tool of economic diplomacy. Why? Because Britain needs to compete with China and India, and development is, you've got to abandon the sort of, um, you know, anti-poverty hippie stuff and start getting on with the, the growth stuff. So this brings me to the second problem of many of my graphs of my table, which is that um, I drew it up in sort of 2010, probably. It found, got published in 2012 in the book, and it's really out of date. You know, I think this idea of the, the Western donors as you know, aid as charity and everything, that's kind of really changing. The public narrative is changing really fast. So we see a southernization. Okay, so to conclude, um, India, I think, has been part of a powerful fracturing of the long-standing material, ideational, ontological hierarchies in international development. A, a, a really a, a upsetting of that dominant north-south axis, whether for mainstream development or for critical development theorists. It's bringing new choices, new ideas, new finances, technologies, set within very attractive narratives of solidarity, opportunity and growth. That said, it's also exporting its own contradictions. Uh, the, the own violence of its development vision, the Gujarat model writ large. And it's doing so, uh, not really, in fact, I would say by refuting, it is just ignoring contested development politics. It's treating development as a technical process of economic growth. And this model does bring opportunity and benefits for some, but exploitation and dispossession for others. There are growing internal debates, which are really interesting. It's a very lively moment for Indian development cooperation. It's really changed in the last decade, that massive expansion. You know, 60 years sort of ticking along, doing its stuff, and a massive expansion in the last decade, and it's leading to new uh, debates about its modalities, its purpose, its positioning, and so on. And then finally for us, you know, in the ivory tower, how do we theorize as critics and students of uh, international development, uh, a rather different development actor, a rather different set of hierarchies and histories and positions in the world. And how do we keep our critical hats on uh, and at the same time um, be, I suppose, uh, critical friends of uh, what is um, very positively a much more polycentric development world? Um, thanks for that uh, very stimulating uh, talk. Um, at the beginning, you talked about the concept of sustainable development. Uh, that's a very contested concept. And it generally, the way the UN and the World Bank and other bodies uh, use it, uh, includes economic growth, continual economic growth. And yet, there's the whole limits to growth argument that uh, is, is coming alive again, particularly in the light of the ecological crisis and, and, and climate change. And I'd be the first one to admit that for countries in the South, uh, there is needed growth. Uh, but then the flip side of that is we could talk about countries in the North, uh, by and large, needing degrowth to create a kind of even playing field. But then it gets complicated as well, because in 
southern countries such as China and India, you have growing social inequality. So you have, for certain sectors, a great deal of growth, and other sectors still sort of being left behind. So I know there's a, there's a lot in my question there, but uh, maybe you can unravel that a bit. <laughs> so while you're thinking about that, Emma, let's, let's take a couple more questions. Yes, you so right at the back corner. If you could wait for, for Cog so everyone could hear your question. Yeah. Um, on the 9th of June, Narendra Modi was in Astana, Kazakhstan. Um, Sorry, where and was he? He was in Astana, Kazakhstan, okay. Kazakhstan. Um, where uh, India became a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation, which shows just how willing the Indian military is to cosy up to China. However, India didn't have a delegate to China's Belt and Road Summit and issued a statement uh, denouncing the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, do you think you could explain why the Indian military is willing to cozy up to China, but its ministries mm. for finance and trade are not? <laughs> um, because as an Australian, that's a bit bizarre. <laughs> Philip Dull, Institute of Postcolonial Studies. Uh, it's along similar lines, but more general. I absolutely accept your central theme about... Uh, uh, the model being uh, uh, Europe and, uh, and so on. Mm. Uh, and I also uh, accept uh, what you have to say about Bandung and non-alignment. And I've always believed that there's that, you know, a continuing tradition, especially, for example, uh, in, 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 well, I won't go on, but I, I, I'm worried very much when I think of... Uh, of Modi's model of development in Gujarat. And uh, mm. I think that uh, there is a lot, a lot of people would say that the middle class, the Indian middle class has become, well, you could say, more and more muscular. And uh, that that tradition of uh, non-alignment and, uh, and so on seems to be uh, perhaps fading. So, so the right-hand column is also problematic in your old... Yeah. So, yeah, so, so can we just let's take one more? Yes, because you've been itching to ask a question and then maybe let you come back, Emma. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, India and China as well. Uh, as we know, China has launched uh, the um, One Bell, One Road uh, as a great step in response to the uh, South, uh, South South Corporation. So what are your ideas of the impact on this China's uh, initiative on India's future actions in South South Corporation? Thank you. Mm. So Emma, two quite specific questions and then two more yeah. general ones. Eh? Yeah, maybe sort of start with the, uh, the China ones. Um, so uh, in, in quick brief, I don't know, uh, really. Uh, uh, I can hazard a, a guess on the military, perhaps, um, which is, uh, oddly enough, militaries, I think, are often very much the more pragmatic end of government. So the American military has been um, talking about climate change for a very long time. Because it can't, I mean, it sounds a bit weird to say this, but it can't afford to delude itself in a way that parts of the political establishment can afford to delude themselves. So um, quite often, in, in some regards at least, you find a curious, progress, not progressiveness would be the wrong thing, but a curious kind of um, relationship between the military and, and um, what's going on. Act actuaries are the, are the next best, or if not better, um, so if you really want to know what's going on in the world, talk to an actuary um, who will tell you that they've, got, they've really got uh, climate risk. You know, they're ready for it because they know it's going to happen. Um, so, um, and, and in any case, you know, any country relationship, you know, it's, they're always multiple. They're always contingent. You've always got kind of one person over here going, oh, they're, they're, they're wicked, they're evil, and over there they're doing business. So I don't think we should be surprised that you've got uh, different sorts of relationships happening in mm. different places and with different levels of visibility. Uh, and it would be unusual for it to be complete, actually, for it to be um, a sort of uniform uh, reaction. Um, and the same, you know, with sort of, um, you know, say the West uh, in relation to, say, China's role in Africa. There's, there's lots of sort of, particularly a decade ago, a few years ago, a lot of critique, which has sort of died down a bit together with familiarity. But all that time, there was lots of business being done with Chinese companies, with Chinese um, uh, 
capital in all sorts of ways. So, you know, what we mean by China and Africa actually turns out to be, a, you know, a kind of, a, you know, the Italians and the Chinese and the French all working together on a scheme. Um, in terms, again, of the, the, the One Belt, One Road, um, I think India recently announced something, didn't it? In a, a, count, a kind of counter project? Isn't there some, something it's sort of, it has made quite a lot of uh, objections. That's right, yeah, yeah, it's partnered with Japan on something. And it's, it's actively and explicitly said this is sort of to counter One Belt, One Road. And development cooperation is being absolutely rolled into these geopolitical kind of sabre rattling. Uh, because it is so many different things. It's, it's diplomatic, it's geopolitical, it's economic, you know, um, and we'll see, just like all development providers, all development partners, that geopolitics is often at the core of what's happening, and India is no different from anyone else. That doesn't mean it's necessarily bad, but it does mean we have to understand it for the foreign policy tool it is. Um, sustainable uh, development. Um, so in one... In some registers, there is the whole leapfrogging thing that, that uh, India and others are saying that they can achieve development without the ecological catastrophe. Um, but in other regards, in, for the most part, I would say that the development ideology is actually in some ways the sort of the, the dinosaur of modernization rears its head again. Um, it, it shares there's some fascinating parallels with the 1950s and 60s. Technological optimism. You know, the West has a kind of an ambivalent relationship with modernity. This was Ulrich Beck's thesis, that we are both attracted and repelled, you know, scared by, by uh, un unleashing the forces of modernity. Um, for many people in the world, they're not, they crave what modernity has to offer, including its concrete jungles and its violences and so on. So that um, I think there's a, a very problematic um, race for economic growth and the, the Gujarat model in with all of its success and energy and, uh, and other and problems is, is very much what's being pursued. So the development cooperation is anchored to the idea of strong states and growing economies. And for the last 15 years, really as a sort of an outlier in Western development, the, the language has been poverty reduction and governance and social welfare. Now, I'm not saying that those things actually happened or everything was fine, but in many ways, it stood apart in a, in a 60, 70 year history of development where economic growth has always been the central motivating sort of engine and goal. And India is putting economic growth first and foremost in a sort of state-led model. Um, um, it, the private sector is the, the vehicle, but the idea of creating strong states. And it has, the, you know, the, it, it shares that assumption, deeply problematic assumption that wealth will just trickle down. So I think uh, I did a little bit of work a while ago on how India's middle classes might feel about its development cooperation. And everything that I could find out and see was that they thought it was good because it was part of that expanding footprint, part of that powerful ambition abroad. So it wasn't like the critique of aid within Western countries, like why are we wasting this money? Because it wasn't understood as going to poor people in poor countries, it was understood as going into economic win-win situations. What is the current situation of Britain's aid to India? Because I remember watching Nigel Farage saying um, that Britain should not be doing any further aid to India. And also Shashi Tharoor was talking about this. Yeah? So I know it's not rooted through the government of India. You're, you're doing it on a, on a different level to different people most in need. But I'd like to know what's the current situation on that yet. Um, some of the, you talked about sort of the southernization of aid and stuff like that, but um, some of the sorts of projects that you were talking about sounded like a lot of things that um, 
uh, you know, traditional donors had sort of done and often um, been more criticised for, especially in terms of mutually beneficial um, aid and stuff that um, trade relationships that benefit the donor. Um, those are often some of the most criti uh, heavily criticised aid programs in Western countries, as well as things like loans have been really criticised as, you know, um, creating those power relationships um, and diplomacy, uh, peacekeeping and diplomacy, that sort of thing, also being really heavily criticised um, in development theory. Um, do you see this, these programs as being substantially different when they're undertaken by India? And is that that they are fundamentally different programs or is it a completely different situation when it's being undertaken by a, develop, a, a developing country or a, a country like India, um, just purely on the basis of the historical differences between India and those traditional donors? UK and India. Aid, um, I'm sorry, we have to mention Nigel Farage in polite company. Um, um, so uh, it's really interesting because it's not actually an exit. So first of all, you have a toxic political situation in the UK where the Daily Mail drives a, a powerful political machine that is just vitriolic uh, alternative facts and, and so on. And it, it, it you know, so there is a there is a quite right debate to be had about should country should countries like say Australia or the UK be giving aid to India? I think that's a perfectly legitimate moral question and a, and a political question to have. But in the UK, it's it's surrounded by this really unpleasant um, kind of uh, discourse, which forces politicians, I think, into unwise positions. But basically, in the case of India, unlike some partner countries, it, India has been in the driving seat. And in 2003, it told most of its donors they could, they could leave. Thank you very much. Anything they provided could go through NGOs. The UK was allowed to retain the relationship, but it, it was going to clearly wind down. Um, and 2015 was the, the date. It became, you know, the, there was that famous comment about a UK aid being a peanut, uh, which it is. But then somebody else said it is like the golden peanut, actually. It's quite, um, it's quite useful in, in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, so what's happened is, um, so then it was debated wrongly as the idea of exit. It was never meant to be exit. It was agreed on both sides it would be transition. So at its height in 2014, UK aid was 300 million pounds to India a year. Now it's about 30 million, but it's doing really different things. And, and this is, I think, quite problematic to label this stuff aid because it's doing economic diplomacy. So the UK is now working with India on its development partnerships. So, for example, the UK is providing assistance to India to get its lines of credit better managed. At the moment, they're quite badly exposed. It's working with India to, in things like smart cities and technology. And it's basically massaging the uh, possibilities of British companies providing services to India. Um, and it's, so it's pulled out of those big traditional projects, whatever you thought of them, you know, are they ineffective or not in Bihar and Orissa and working with, you know, 100,000 small farmers. And it's really about massaging a diplomatic and economic relationship. Problematically, I think, still in the, under the umbrella of... Um, development and still using ODA, where you can argue it's a perfectly legitimate relationship to be having, but why are we, why are we using foreign aid? You know, is, is that not, uh, should, shouldn't we be doing this under trade or something else? So um, one of, and this is happening universally. A lot of donors are redrawing the geography of their partnerships, but also the content and moving away from anti-poverty, millennium development goal type um, projects and, um, you know, sort of frameworks to uh, growth projects. Um, so development is one of the ways in which the UK is desperately hanging on to the coattails of India in our post-Brexit referendum <laughs> suicidal crisis. Um, because, and it's, and it's, and it's being used as a, as a hook to stay, you know, to try and open up into the Indian economy a bit further. Um, Yes, uh, the, the MDGs, I, I don't think, I think it was coincidental that as, as you know, human Fukuda Pa write this brilliant 
piece about this window that opened of, and the alignment of several forces and out popped the MDGs, most surprisingly. Um, and then China kind of comes in and, and does what a lot of countries want, which is build stuff. Um, I don't think now, I think, they're not at all incompatible. So, f so you have a huge turn. All the Western donors are now talking about infrastructure. They're all talking about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But the UK isn't going to be able to compete with China to build the road. But what it can do is provide the legal services, the financial agreements, it can do the, the governance stuff. There's an awful lot of mutual benefit, you know, with, with China building the road and the UK financing the mine or the logging concession at the end of it, um, or, or co-financing the, the you know, agribusiness project. Um, and, and, it, and it's clear that um, this is what I mean by the southernization and the sort of ideational success of the South is that and Barack Obama, you know, going, oh, hang on, what you didn't want us was to lecture you about governance. It turns out, you know, you wanted a massive ecologically catastrophic dam, but you do want it, you know, and the Chinese are providing it. Um, and then the, the southernization, are, are they doing things that <coughs> Western donors could be critiqued for? Yes, absolutely. And, and I say this as a critical friend, you know, one of the th problems, it seems to me, with this boundary making with the West, you know, we're not like you. We're not kind of colonial, you know, post-imperial delusional ex-masters. We're, you know, kind of brothers. Is you talk to sort of people in Nepal and they go, yeah, ha, 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 <laughs> you know. And uh, there's a nice paper by Adhikari who talks about Indian, the Nepalese perceptions of Indian development cooperation. And it's big brother swinging on in going, hey, listen, what are you guys doing? You know, I was going to be rude there. But, you know, using racial epithets and, and um, ex making exactly very similar mistakes to traditional donor part partners. So just because it's India doing it, doesn't make it any better than, you know, Germany doing it, really. And so this is one of my arguments. It's a very it's an extraordinarily simple argument. I mean, if any of you do have five-year-olds, you can tell them this and they'll grasp it instantly, you know, um, that we can't just pretend there is this sort of South-South inhabiting a kind of purer realm of post-colonial uh, purity and a kind of imperial North. And, and equally, the the critiques that we use for the North can also be turned, but, it, but in ways that recognize also the specificity and the difference of the South, uh, where, the, where the difference resides. Uh, picking up on your last comment on boundary making, um, what does India take out of Africa? What does it borrow from its aid partnerships in Africa? Um, for instance, you know, um, even though India is better in transport trains, um, we've had a Chinese train project with Chinese symbols, Chinese uniforms, Chinese language, nothing African, and yet India is better at it. Um, Kenya has a greater telephone mobile system, uh, banking system, and India is only just catching up on it. So is it still not a patron kind of relationship, a hierarchical relationship? Um, in, in this race in Africa between China and India, what does India take back from Africa as a partner? So the, the question was, what does India take back? This is meant to be mutually beneficial, win-win. Um, that's a really good point. I was um, talking, I went to hear my colleague Sachin Chattavedi talk. So Sachin is the head of uh, RIS, Research and Information Systems, a very, um, very uh, respectable government think tank. Very caught up actually with, Indi it was founded under Indira Gandhi and very much of this kind of that origins. And um, Sachin and I don't see eye to eye on everything. And I, I, I tease him sometimes and try and get him to admit some of these things and he, he, he'll, he never, never deviates from the message. But I really like him and he's been a tremendous norm entrepreneur, a tremendous um, advocate and, and of development cooperation in India and very much part of that conversation of how does it change in this new era. And he gave a talk and at the end of it I said, Sachin, you've given that entire talk and you talked about mutual benefit and you never once said, what does India get from the partner countries? And Sachin was stricken and he said, oh, I didn't, did I? And I said, can you think of anything? And he went, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, and, and again, I mean, this is one of these sorts of um, critiques is that underneath that language of mutuality is in fact a very strong sense of patron, patronage. 
sometimes uncomfortably allied to a kind of civilizational superiority, in some cases, particularly within the region and Africa and so on, um, that is certainly mimics other hierarchies and so on. Again, done in a particular way. So, so there too, you know, it, it's, it's not that there aren't kind of, um, you know, this, this happens in Brazil as well, a very interesting relationship, say, between Brazilian development partners and Mozambican partners and so on. So India is not alone in this. But there's unquestionably a sort of a, a hierarchical thing. So, uh, Susan Bailey, who's a spectacular um, historian, she looked at um, Vietnamese development workers in the 1970s and 80s, working in places like Yemen and Mongolia and elsewhere. And she, and she was fascinatingly unpicked the sort of individual, personal and family tensions of what it was to insist on brotherhood and equality, but at the same time to be convinced that basically Vietnam was con significantly more advanced than Yemen uh, in every way and to be giving the gifts of civilization to the Yemen at the same time as trying to maintain this narrative of equality and mutual benefit. And she looked at some of the sort of, literally sort of the cognitive tensions of, of that project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a bit specific question about like Pakistan. Like China has been increasingly investing in Pakistan in recent years, like in the Belt Road Initiative, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is one of the key projects, or say, a collection of projects with dams to be built, coal plants to be built, a lot of things like that. But on the other hand, India likely in Africa is becoming like, uh, like an increasingly a more important like developing like lenders, okay. So do you have like a kind of interpretation of the geopolitics of China's recent increasingly like investment in Pakistan? from the Indian perspective, thank you. Yeah. So I think the, the key there, so I don't know so much about that, is, but the key is Afghanistan. So that India is um, the fifth biggest donor to Afghanistan. And India has quite a substantial development cooperation relationship. It rebuilt the Afghan parliament building. It's building a big road project. It's got all sorts of other stuff going on, including one of its rare civil society projects. So Sewa the Self-Employed Women's Association, is training Afghan women uh, and actually doing a fantastic job. Really, really interesting how they're approaching it. Um, and of course, part of that Indian engagement in Afghanistan is um, to annoy Pakistan. Um, and it's very much caught up. You know, so India built a bunch of, um, I think it was something like, you know, kind of badged as, as cultural institutes all along the uh, border <laughs> with um, Pakistan. And they're, they're listening posts, you know. Um, so uh, that development cooperation then is, is about consolidating a relationship with, with Afghanistan, but also doing so in a manner that is trying to, um, it is distinctly um, combative with uh, Pakistan and with China. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of points that you made. Uh, you spoke about the southernization of aid with the UK's aid program, program becoming more like India's. And you also talked about um, India's changing narrative from become, shifting more from, more from being more idealistic to more pragmatic like Germany and the UK. And those, um, it, it seems like... Um, is, is there a contradiction there? Or are they both coming and meeting in the middle? Is that, yeah, are, are they different? Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to describe it. So, so all, all, all donors and partners have pragmatic goals. It's all real politique. Um, it's all about, you know, kind of geopolitical advantage, about economic relationships, about standing and status in the world. Um, they're not necessarily bad things to seek. Um, but they're all, that's what it's all about for everyone. And then over that is a sort of a set of cultural and moral narratives, which are not necessarily untrue either. They're not just just a veneer, but, they are all, but they're often distinctive to a positioning. So Britain's cultural and moral narrative is strongly inflected by its imperial past, for which it makes no apology ever in its aid and development relationships. 
you know, whereas um, some, of the, some other European countries see it as a, a kind of a redeeming themselves from their colonial past. I've never heard a single official British statement that links development cooperation to some of the sins of either colonialism or more recent disastrous geopolitical interventions like in Iraq, never once. India clothes its pragmatic development cooperation in a different moral and uh, cultural language. And again, it's not, it's not a veneer, it's deeply meaningful. You know, it has deep purchase, I think, that Nehruvian <coughs> solidarity and so on. So, so all development partners have a combination of pragmatism and, and a kind of a framed within a claim to a certain morality that sometimes gets a little bit chipped away in the reality. Um, what I'd say is that in terms of the, both the practices and the languages of, let's call it in both cases, aid, the West has moved southwards. If, if by that we mean a focus on infrastructure, a focus on economic growth as the sort of central analytic of development rather than poverty reduction, um, uh, a focus on national self-interest, so the, in 2015, the UK produced its most recent aid policy called Tackling Global Challenges in the National Interest. So we always know, I mean, though, you know, it's always clear that aid is in the national interest, but it's rarely been just out there on the table. Hey, everyone, this is... And the UK still says, oh, by the way, our national interest is good for your national interest. Um, you know, um, but now it's, now it's just it's explicit. Um, because, you know, as, as Craig was mentioning at the start, we have a very sceptical British public to convince. So, um, that, so it is contradictory on, on, on all sides, but I would say that um, I was trying to argue that um, in terms of, let's say, the UK, but the UK isn't alone in this, in uh, the Dutch, very similar, even the Norwegians. I mean, all the kind of like nice left-wing progressive donors, you know, we're not just talking about the Americans. It really is the kind of the, you know, the, the hippie end of the spectrum have all turned into hardline um, brutes in the aid world. Uh, um, so the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Swedish, the Danish, um, absolutely kind of going down this national self-interest, economic growth is everything sort of route. I caricature, but not much. I did warn Emma in advance that the vid that the presentation was being videoed for posterity, you, but you will get the chance to edit out sections <laughs> no. so, so that you don't get complaints I, from I, Nigel I was, Farage or I, you know, the I American stand by government. I, I don't care if Nigel Farage doesn't like it. <laughs> um, we, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, but um, I know that many of you will still have questions. Um, and I know, knowing Emma, that she would be delighted to, to, um, to receive those by email or um, uh, to, to, to hear from you um, in, in a moment at the front. Uh, I've, I've certainly found this an incredibly uh, illuminating presentation, Emma, and you've given us a, a huge amount to, to think about and also challenged so many assumptions that we might have ab about development and about India, which is precisely what the, the keyword series was set up to do, and to, and to use a word, actually, as a grant, to, to think about um, a whole set of economic, political, and social questions that are alive in the current moment. And I think the, the other thing that's, that's very apparent from the questions is, is just how current this is. Uh, and, and how important. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. For such a stimulating presentation and um, we look forward to hearing you again at the Australia India Institute. Thanks very much. Thank